For Ivan, um, I have tried to, to combine the Slo ones, uh, the Slovenian historiography and those three generations of Western, but I wasn't able to find any. So I I congratulate you with um, so you at least could follow some steps of Croatian historiography and this three Western generation of. Um, but the question is another one. Um, um, is the Croatian historiography in any way interested in the role of Italy? Because the role of Italy, the, now we are approaching the 2015 and uh, the opening of Italian Front. And one of the, let's say, central Slovenian topics um, is the London Treaty and the entrance of Italian war. We have two books written um, from of, uh, from Slovenian author, but based on uh, American and English documents, particularly American documents. And I wonder, is there any, because the London Treaty um, concerns also, concerned also Croatian, Croatian uh, population and lands, if there is anything going on 
um, around this topic in Croatian historiography? Yes, uh, two brief questions. First to Andras. Uh, Henrik Marcelli was mentioned, and my question is that uh, during his uh, life and his very uh, rich uh, uh, findings and works, uh, do you mean that uh, he changed something uh, in his conceptions and approaches to, uh, to the history uh, as, as the young Marsali and, and the uh, <coughs> elder Marsali uh, could be not uh, opposed but a, a, a bit different? It's, it's, a, it's a very brief question and, and another to Iva, which uh, is more exciting to me that uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, Croatian his historiography uh, was under the impact uh, when they studied uh, the history of Austro-Hungarian monarchy. The question is that uh, this conception, this approach uh, can be uh, can be uh, found, can be regarded when the Croatian historians wrote about earlier period, namely about the 18th century and the first part of the 19th century. And I'm asking this because I have an example from the Serbian historiography. There was uh, a, an academic, uh, Mita Kostic, or Kostic, I apologize for my pronunciation, and Mita Kostic, uh, when he was young, he was graduated in, in Vienna, from the University of Vienna, on the, uh, on the book, uh, history of book trade uh, in, uh, uh, in the uh, time of Maria Theresa, blah, 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 uh, we did not have time for, for this. And uh, <coughs> uh, old Mita Kostic, uh, uh, was the director of the Institute of uh, History of Academy of Sciences in Serbia. And uh, when I uh, work uh, with uh, his, uh, his uh, papers and books, uh, I can realize that uh, uh, also uh, uh, he con his, his works concern the history of 18th century, uh, the young hostage and the old hostage uh, changed. I mean, it's, it's normal because a normal person uh, generally uh, changes his ideas, but, uh, but the question is that why? And, and so, briefly, uh, to what extent this conception made impact uh, on the uh, studies and researches of the history of earlier <laughs> period uh, uh, of, uh, of Habsburg Empire? before Austro-Hungarian monarchy. Thank you. Hey, Andres, um, if you are talking about the historiography uh, of Hungary and the interwar period, uh, it's very important um, to research the memoirs and the articles of, uh, and other works of the military officers. Um, I think you uh, hadn't talked about this. Uh, haven't you done a research? No, 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 no. Yeah, okay, then. No question. <laughs> okay, I concentrated on diplomatic history. Uh, it's so, another type uh, of thing for me. <laughs> so there's one more question from Tom, and is there, because at one point we should give the floor to our uh, presenter. So then, Tom. Okay, one brief question to Professor Schmidl. Uh, my question is about our uh, Austria, or call it German identity in Austria just before 1914. How should we call the Germans, the Austrians, the Germans on uh, the, the Austrian Germans, or the Germans on Austrian, or you know, the, the Austrian on German origins. This is always my question, and whenever I try to examine the same newspapers in Galicia, they switch, they switch um, the names so much that it's a very hard problem for us. Of course, for us it's much much easier because we have the Germans in Austria and the Germans in Prussia. But how it looks like from Austrian, let's call it Austrian point of view before 1914. Thank you very much. Well, and I will have to use my permission to do 
short questions on that because I was intrigued by the idea you brought up uh, that, in a sense, the, during the Second World War, in many countries, uh, decision makers try to replay or, or reenact the First World War in a different way, so avoid to avoid with the problem. And it's not true, not just for, for losers like Hungary, but actually for winners like Romania. Uh, so, whether you think, <coughs> that's a very good question, whether you think, and would like to know whether you think that uh, this uh, actually, uh, so what happened among the decision makers during the Second World War actually uh, supports the this, the, first. Uh, the Second World War, so this idea of reenactment, it supports this uh, still, uh, this popular thesis of the two world wars being uh, separate stages of uh, new 30 years of war. Or it's rather the other way around. So, so uh, uh, the, it is the this perspective of the decision maker that still influences uh, historiography or or the, the conceptualization of history. So, today. So, today. today. Mm -hmm. uh, so then it is the last question, and then I propose to start with Andreas and go in the in the order. So first, uh, you would like me to answer yeah, still the answer question. question? Okay, con <coughs> concerning uh, Marcelik, uh, uh, I haven't done any detailed research in, in, in his life or biography, but um, it, it would be um, a good field of research as he lived a long life uh, as a historian. He lived all through the, um, the early decades of uh, the dualist monarchy and then the First World War. Um, uh, the, uh, before the First World War, the crisis of the U.S. monarchy, and then the interval period, and he died in 1940. Um, concerning his pamphlet, I would call it a pamphlet rather than a historian's work, uh, work uh, he, he complains about the lack of sources which the, um, the, the winners don't provide us. So, as he did a lot of research previously in the Middle Ages, the medieval period, he, uh, he uh, used a, a simile, uh, so we are fighting like uh, those ones uh, who were buried in the ground in the Middle Ages and had to fight uh, with, with their two hands uh, against a, a well-equipped knight, because they have all the resources, or sorry, all the sources back in their archives, uh, the Serbs and the Western powers, the winners, and we, we don't have the same, we have only our own sources. That's, that's what he expressed, so we have nothing else to do but to, to protect our standpoint. And while well, ready, I don't <coughs> uh, the mythical leader, Fisa. He, he, that, that's, that's the central focal point of the uh, pamphlet. The second question was not entirely clear for me, so how in modern historiography, yeah, it's a, it's, um, it's a, it's a conceptual, conceptual conceptualization of, uh, of history. So whether uh, whether the fact that these decision makers during the Second World War mm -hmm. still try to reenact some of the First World War supports this position that the two wars are uh, stages of one mm -hmm. war, or it is rather the other way around that. Uh, this perspective of the decision makers was somehow not really connected to the First World War, but this okay. still imposed something on I could say that in the case of uh, Hungary's um, Second World War Prime Minister, who was in office for two years, it was a very central issue, and for the people around him, not to, not to close the sec Second World War as the first one was closed. And, uh, for a more, more general public, so to say, um, it was somewhat similar. Um, even for um, um, even for the, the left wing, uh, even for the social democrats, I, I, I would say, uh, all, all those who were critical of the events, who were part of the political establishment of the interwar, interwar period. Uh, it was uh, vital not to see the events of 1918 and then 1919 repeated 
which meant um, loss of control. And um, they destroyed the, the conservative leaders and that during the Second uh, World War, they strongly believed that um, uh, if uh, they, they don't draw, draw the conclusions of the First World War and they, uh, and they lose control at the end, then um, the, the successor states, the successor states, the neighboring states, will be even more successful than they <laughs> used to be during uh, and after the, the First World War. And obviously Romania was the central uh, issue as the, the Romanian world fuss during the First World War uh, was not successful immediately, but was <coughs> successful, could gain the most of the territories at the end, and it will happen again. And um, obviously Romania and the territorial dispute over Transylvania was the last, sort of last chance for a, a territorial win at the end of the Second World War, as um, there was no real chance to get back territories from, from, from Yugoslavia or Czechoslovakia, which were sure to be restored after the Second World War. Did I hang oh, on? Okay. And, uh, well, uh, one of our famous national writers, um, novel writers and poets, Jula Eyesh, uh, he, he said that 1918 um, meant freedom for, uh, for, uh, for the people, but it did not mean freedom for, for the nation. Uh, it, I think it's very well known um, among Hungarians, this quotation. And um, that was more or less the, the fear of uh, a wider uh, public in, in Hungary during the Second World War. Was it too long? Sorry. Okay. Um, uh, just a short remark uh, about the plaques in World War on the monuments. Uh, the general rule is that you have World War I monuments put up during or after the world, First World War and then the names for the Second World War added. Normally there would be about twice the number of dead for the Second World War than for the First World War in the rule of thumb. <coughs> and of course there is some discussion about the inscriptions. Normally it would be for Kaiser Volk of Vaterland, the Volk of Heimat or something. And in recent years, the question was, especially for the Second World War, was it really for Volk und Heimat uh, these soldiers were killed? And it goes with the discussion which came up, especially in the public during the 1980s, uh, over the uh, over the wartime past of uh, presidential candidate and later president Kurt Waldheim just doing his duty. And this was. Um, accepted without question in the 1960s, but in the 1980s things look different. There is a new trait in her historiography of being very critical also of the, of the Habsburg monarchy, uh, two young historians, um, um, uh, Verena Moritz and Hans Leidinger published the Black Book on, of the Habsburgs, and so uh, there's a bit of questioning of, of the past or of this over positive image of but by and large, this, as far as the monument goes, that's the rule. Um, uh, POW cemeteries in Austria and public reaction. Um, normally, I mean, there are uh, the question of prisoner of war camps and internment camps in Austria was something which came up rather late, uh, normally because of local interest. <coughs> And you have some publications by people from the region, not by trained historians originally, who said, well, there was a prisoner of war camp, what happened here, we do have a cemetery or so, and starting research. And as far as I know, but I would have to, to check on this, I don't remember whether the, uh, the graves of uh, uh, Allied soldiers would be protected in the Treaty of Saint-Germain. I don't know about this. Uh, in the case of the Second World War, there is a clause in the State Treaty of 1955 that monuments or cemeteries uh, for uh, Allied soldiers um, killed during or after the Second World War are to be uh, the responsibility of the, of the government. Uh, normally, all um, public cemeteries of this kind are handled by the Minister of Interior and uh, the care of military uh, tombs
this is normally carried out through the Black Cross Association, which is uh, like the German Kriegsleber, Volksbund zu Friede oder Kriegsleber, something. It's a voluntary but state supported organization taking care of both military cemeteries in Austria and abroad. Uh, the, uh, organizationally, we had, we had uh, in 1914, uh, prisoners of war were mainly brought to the western parts of the monarchy, which means today's Austria, <coughs> plus the Bojom district in Hungary, um, to be, be away from the fighting. And then suddenly the new front opened in 1915, so a number of prisoners of war came in southern Austria were moved north again. So they were, uh, in addition to Bohemia and Moravia, of course, there were numerous camps uh, in Austria and that these were uh, for prisoners of war as well as for uh, interned civilians. And this means normally Austrian or Hungarian citizens. And with very small numbers only being foreign citizens. Um, there's now a lot of new research on this. Um, there are local cemeteries. There was a quite, a, quite an interesting investigation carried out about the internment camp at Tarnhof near Graz, where, the, where the, the Graz airport now is, which was a big internment camp for Ruthenians, which means Ukrainians, which was practically unknown in Austria. There was the question whether now our jets are sort of rolling over the graves of, of internal people, which was not the case. Uh, but this was one of the cases where, because of these discussions, a proper investigation was carried out by the Ministry of Defense because part of this airport at that time was still used by the military. And, and a lot of dissertations and theses have since been written, and a lot of news, new research has been brought up. And there are still uh, small things like, for example, in some places you would find a Russengasse or Russenweg referring to Russian prisoners of war who built this road during World War I. Um, and by and large it was a question which was long forgotten and which came up only in, in recent years. Um, the identity of Austrians before World War I. How, much, how many hours do we have? Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question which is difficult to answer and which I think is impossible to generalize. Um, by and large, you would have, uh, for most German Austrians, but not only for German Austrians, you would have at least three levels of identity. One being Austrians in the sense of Austrian citizens. And that was a question of their political conviction, whether they would be totally schwarz gelb, black, yellow, oriented toward the monarchy, the emperor, or whether they would say, um, well, they are loyal citizens, but. Uh, then there would be the sort of ethnical, national identity referring to the language. And there again, it's a question whether this would be very important or not. If you are living, if you were living in Salzburg, for example, your question or your ethnic national identity would not, not be much of a question. Uh, it, when you were a German, uh, Austrian German, German Austrian, living, for example, in Zille, Zelle or Marburg, Maribor, or let's say in some other parts of mixed population, then of course you would say, well, I'm German. Um, and uh, there were groups, uh, not very big, but politically quite, uh, quite active, like the, uh, the pan-German movement, the Altdeutsche Bewegung, who looked rather towards Russia and then towards Vienna. And, but the followers of these movements were mainly in southern Styria, in, uh, in Bohemia, in those parts where the question of identity was a real one. Because when you are among, as a German speaker, among German speakers, as a Hungarian, among Hungarian speakers, this question does not really uh, become so important. And then, of course, the third identity, which probably was for many people the most important one, is the local identity. And this is the one which con continued right through, because uh, there you are a 
uh, Salzburgian, uh, Tyrolian, uh, Carinthian, Estyrian, and this continues to this very day. Um, and for many Austrians, I mean, we now have the, the European identity, the Austrian identity, but what for many Austrians is still the strongest one is, uh, I'm a Styrian and I'm not a Carinthian, and uh, so on. I'm from Vienna myself, so of course Vienna is different. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but for, for many parts of today, Aust today's Austria, of course, this regional identity is still very strong and very important, and I assume it also was uh, in the days before 1914. Uh, what I think is important, we had, I had a long discussion with Tamara Scheer, who is working about this issue now, and I think you know her, um, just recently, that uh, we tend to think of the identity before 1914, the identity after 1918, identities change, and they probably evolved long before 1914, and the identity of many German Austrians in 1848, in 1866, would have been different from, let's say, 1910, 1918, and these things take shape, they vary, they become more, more important in a different context. The question which you, you ask, it's something which we are also facing, uh, and for which there's probably no answer, is somebody a German Austrian, an Austrian German, how do we call a Romanian from Hungary, who is a Hungarian citizen during the First World War? Um, it's, it, it's, it's difficult and it's even more difficult when we write about it. I mean, is somebody an Italian from the monarchy? Uh, is he a uh, Trentinian? Uh, I mean, it, it's sometimes difficult, uh, difficult to narrow down and of course we don't know now how he might have felt at the time. Sorry, there's no clear answer to this. It's a very good question. sure that 
there was a story that his personal papers from the war archive somehow got lost. Because there was a old books plot about him, and this is apparently no longer there. And the second thing is what you said about this choking. Um, he apparently, uh, Tito apparently uh, uh, had a very, at least towards Austrians, a sort of a rather relaxed attitude <coughs> towards the old monarchy. There's a story when, uh, when a bridge was opened at Radkesburg, um, in the southeastern corner of Austria, uh, uh, connecting Radkesburg to the, uh, to the Slovenian side. Uh, that, um, uh, and that was a, a bridge jointly opened in the late 60s by Tito and uh, Franz Jonas, who was Austrian president at the time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and somebody asked how this bridge should, should be named. And Tito said, well, oh, quite simply, Franz Joseph Bridge. Um, I'm Joseph, and, and, and he's uh, Franz Jonas. So it's Franz Joseph Bridge. So, um, I mean, this would, would point to a sort of a, a rather relaxed uh, view of his own past. I think that Vladimir Petr also mentioned it, that he mentioned his involvement in the campaign during the meeting with the Russian ambassador. And uh, the rest of the people who were uh, around, around him were stunned. Uh, so, uh, regarding Tuzman, <laughs> uh, as far as I can remember, uh, he wrote one paper uh, and it was published for the 50th anniversary of the foundation of the Yugoslav Committee uh, in the 1960s. And also he talked about it uh, in his main book, in his thesis, uh, Croatia in Monarchy Yugoslavia. Uh, it's a two volume uh, analysis of the uh, situation in Croatia during the interval uh, period, but I can honestly can't remember that was something that uh, there was <coughs> not in the accordance uh, with the dominant narrative in the, uh, the second Yugoslavia, but I have to check that up. I'm, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, the third question was regarding the Italy. Uh, as far as I know, recently, no. Uh, Earlier, uh, in, uh, during the Second Yugoslavia, there was uh, in, uh, interest and it was especially emphasized uh, in the time of crisis uh, in relation between the Italy and uh, Yugoslavia. Uh, the focus was, of course, on protections on the eastern Adriatic coast, uh, Istria and Dalmatia. I think recently only a professor from the Faculty of Law uh, in Rijeka did uh, uh, something on that topic. Uh, Maybe studying the situation in Eureka and Susha uh, after 1980. Uh, and the fourth question was uh, regarding the influence of dominant narrative on previous uh, eras. Uh, of course, uh, dominant narrative influenced the research of other uh, periods too. Uh, uh, as, uh, I think you, you mentioned the 17th and 18th century. Uh, I think. Uh, Regarding that this period, uh, in a lesser extent, uh, exception was of course the 19th century, which was of course crucial in the time of in the, uh, in the process of nation formation and the process of uh, formation of modern Croatian nation. So uh, the influence of dominant narrative on 19th, on the research of 19th century is much more uh, emphasized than in seventh, or in the study of 17th or 18th century. Well, we are you know, quite behind our schedule, uh, but as I mentioned, uh, we could uh, start the next session with somewhat belatedly. So there is a lunch break, uh, hopefully we will find some sandwiches outside, and I propose to reconvene ourselves at uh, 13.45 to start the third panel. Thank mm -hmm. you.